noche. I believe we're finally live. Um, if anybody's out there and you can see us, let us know. I think we got this thing figured out. Good morning. Um, welcome to to our our streaming uh, worship service of Wheelock Baptist Church. Uh, we're having to do it from our home uh, here in Franklin. So I guess you could say this is our our first satellite campus of, of Wheelock Baptist Church. Um, well, I think my computer's still glitching, giving me a little problems. Let me see something real quick. There we go. I think I got it working now. Um, we're glad you can join us this morning. Uh, this morning we're going to begin, uh, as Psalms 100 tells us, to, to make a joyful noise. Uh, I believe that's what I'm going to attempt to do. Fortunately, I'm surrounded by these these lovely ladies here will help us uh, worship this morning. And so we're going to, if you know them, we're going to do a couple of courses that are very familiar, um, uh, more precious than silver. And God is so good. Kind of do that like a medley. And then we'll do the hymn, Savior like a shepherd lead us. And so, so uh, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll see what happens here. Father, we know that you are a good, good God. And as we humble ourselves before you this morning, Lord, I just pray that you would receive this worship and be honored by it. Father, in a time when when things are just uncertain and uh, we're, we're learning how to handle life in a different situation, Lord, they, we always remember that you are the constant. Father, that you've been with us forever. Um, you will be with us through this whole time. Because, God, you are an eternal God, and, Lord, we just put our hope in you. So, Father, as we come together in this household and households all over come together to give time to just focus on you, may there be a sweet, sweet spirit, Lord, just amongst us all. May we be united as one in the, in the form of worship to you. Father, we praise you. We thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, now uh, let's see what happens. All right, let's see.
Savior like a shepherd lead us. Thank you, ladies, for helping us with that. Well, uh, now to move into something I'm a little more comfortable with, uh, and, and that's teaching the Word of God. Um, I, I love the Word of God. It has such a um, great place within our hearts, and it's just a source of comfort to us that we know God cares for us and that He's willing to leave us His words that we can find that source of comfort and joy. Again, welcome to our home this morning. Uh, as we are gathered together as a family, I know you are as well. Um, I pray that it's a, a special time. Um, we still get to meet uh, in, in that aspect. And, you know, I really can't wait till we get a chance to all come back together. Uh, I know um, this should really make us feel like uh, we're uh, family that's been gone for a while and can't wait to return. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I can't wait for our, our whole family to come back together and, and celebrate in that. This morning, I want to talk to you for a little while about um, uh, out of the book of John, chapter 12. Uh, we're going to read a, a little more about a character I introduced last week, uh, Mary of Bethany. Uh, if you remember last week's story, uh, Mary did the needful thing in sitting at the feet of Jesus uh, and, and learning from him. And today we're going to see how that pays off. What, what, how does it, you know, when we're, we're sitting at the feet of Jesus and we're learning from him, how does that pay off? How does, how, do, what does that look like when we implement that? And so, uh, today I want us to focus that what we learn from Mary also is attitude empowers action. Our attitude empowers action. The, the, the way we think the way we act, the way we behave, uh, it ultimately affects the way we behave. And so uh, let's let's begin to work that way. You know, uh, one thing about family is we get together, we really don't spend this much time with our family. It really reminds me of, of Christmas time uh, because usually the school's out at Christmas and we always have that couple of weeks where we spend with each other. And, and one thing about Christmas that I really enjoy is that other than the time to spend together is I'll be honest, I like getting gifts. I'm, I like it when people get me things. Um, uh, that's my love language is getting. I hope uh, I give as much as I get. I, I try to, but, but yes, getting is, 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 is one of my love languages. And I think honestly, all of us like a little special gift, but how do you ever know? How, how, how do you get that special gift or how do you give that special gift? And uh, this, this year I, I got two great gifts. Right. And I'm going to show them to you this morning and you may not think that they're all that great, but I'm going to tell you why they're great. Um, first thing is I got a tabletop. See, I got a tabletop billiard set. Now, this is a great gift. I'll tell you why. Not because I love pool or because I play a lot of pool, because I do like to play pool, but 
this gift was given to me by my oldest daughter. And the reason why this gift is special to me is because this is the first gift that she ever got from me by raising her own money. She worked hard all year. She has different projects here and there, teaching tennis and making mums and whatnot. But this was bought out of her own funds. I didn't give her a single dime to go shopping for me or her mother. So that's why this will always be special. Now, the other gift, and, and when you men see this out here, you're going to want one for yourself, is, is my pillow. Right. And you might think, why is that special? And I'll tell you why. Because my youngest daughter, Zoe, she got me this gift. And as you can see, it says Dad Spot. Well, there are two things that are sacred to me in this household. My spot on the couch and my remote controls. Right. And the problem is uh, when I come in and I can't find my remote controls, I might get a little grumpy or a little cranky. And nine times out of ten, when I can't find my remotes, it's because I left them somewhere. And so Zoe, knowing these things, she uh, got me a marker for my spot. And then if you also see on this pillow here, it says remotes here so it's got its own little pocket where i can stick my remotes and not lose them but she knew me and she knew something that would make me happy and so she got me this gift now when it comes to gift giving um what makes a gift meaningful and so here's some ideas if you're going to go out and you're going to get a gift um of of ways to make that gift meaningful um number one when you buy a gift for somebody you know you need to make sure that it's useful uh, there's nothing like getting a gift that is like just the perfect thing that you needed and you put it right to use. Two, you got to make sure it's a surprise. Now, what I'm talking about there is sometimes you get somebody a gift and I'm really bad about this. Um, when I get somebody a gift, I want to give it to them right there and then. Um, but, but sometimes uh, it's hard for me to try to keep that gift back until the right time. And so I'll talk about it. And then ultimately I usually end up giving it before it's time. And then I have to go get another gift. And so, so that's just uh, kind of how, uh, how it works with. So make sure that gift stays a surprise. And three, um, make sure the gift is of good quality. Uh, there's nothing like getting a gift and opening it up and you breaking it within you know 30 minutes of having it so make sure it's something that's a, a, of good quality and then the fourth thing here is make sure the gift and I think this is the most important thing make sure the gift truly reflects how you feel about the person um, when I gift shop, that's what I try to do. I try to think, you know, what what can I buy that reflects how I feel about somebody? And so, so those are kind of some of the rules that I use to get a gift. But honestly, the the the, the number one thing I think when it comes to getting gift is that you care. Um, these are steps, and they're only going to be steps that you take if you care. So, with this in mind. Um, what did the last gift that you gave God look like? Think about that. Daily, we have the opportunity to give a gift to God in a way that, we, that responds to his goodness in our lives. Um, as you respond, do you put much thought into it? Is worship, which is definitely a, a gift that we offer back to him, is it something that you contemplate? Is it something that you look forward to? Or is it just something that, oh, it's time to worship, so let's just go do that? Or um, today, we'll just go here. Today, um, we're going to look at a story in the Bible that illustrates the idea that when it comes to honoring Christ, our attitudes empower our actions. Our attitudes empower our actions. And so let's look at that. John 12, uh, beginning in verse 1. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had risen from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly ointment of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Stop right there. 
So here's kind of the setting. Jesus uh, is on his way to Jerusalem. It's about six days before Passover. Um, this would be the last Passover that Jesus would have with his disciples before he was crucified. And on his way, he stops in a town called Bethany. Well, he has good friends that live in Bethany. Um, there's uh, Lazarus, there's Martha, there's Mary, that's the family. But there was also, Mark tells us that there's another gentleman by the name of Simon the leper that, that Jesus had healed there in Bethany. And so we believe that this here is, is taking place in Simon's house. And he's kind of went in with Martha and Mary and Lazarus to to host uh, this meal in honor of Jesus. And so so while they're there, they're enjoying the meal. Uh, Lazarus, it said, was sitting at the table, probably listening to Jesus talk. Um, Martha was doing what Martha does. She was busy serving, making sure everything was just right. But then Mary does something very unique. Mary comes in with this alabaster box full of a contents called spikenard. Now, spikenard was a was a perfume of the day. It was it was more like an oily ointment that was used to to uh, put on it, and it came from India, so it had to travel a long ways to get there. So it was it was very pricey. Um, in ounces, it was about the size of a, of a can of soda, so that's how much it was there. And what Martha do, or Mary does with this is she she Mark says he pours it on his head and all over Jesus' body, but John pays special attention to the fact that Mary anoints Jesus' feet and then wipes it with her hair as an act of worship. This act of worship is so fragrant that it fills up the entire house with a wonderful smell. Continue reading. Verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. We see that Mary does this great act of worship for Jesus and then Judas stands up and he speaks up and in and, and Mark's account of this, it's Judas also starts gathering support from other people who are in the room and Judas's main uh, object with this is that it could have been sold. And it could have uh, been used to feed the poor. But remember, as John's writing this, what John didn't know as he was experiencing this in the room was that Judas was actually a thief. And John takes note, takes time to to know that that he uh, was a thief. And the only reason why he was causing a concern, the reason why he was raising ruckus was because he wanted the money for himself. Um, and so. As, as he's raising objections, what we found out from him was that this ointment was about 300 denarii, which was about a year's worth of savings uh, for the average worker in this day. Now, I was just curious if today, what would that look like? And so I was wondering, what is the most expensive perfume there is on the market? And so as I got on Google, I looked it up. And what it told me was that there's a there's a product out there, Clive Christian number no. one Imperial Majesty perfume sells for twelve thousand dollars seven hundred or twelve thousand seven hundred and twenty two dollars per ounce. That's some expensive smell good right there. But um, if you were to want to to smell some spikenard, want to get some from yourself uh, in this day of essential oils. There is uh, plenty out there, so you can buy some essential oil, some spikenard essential oil for about $624 a pound. So there you go. If you're curious to know what that room would have smelled like, there it is. Um, verse 7. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So as Mary does this and Judas stands up, it's pretty clear what's going on here. There's a contrast of characters. There's Mary who loves and adores Jesus, and then there's Judas who loves and adores himself. Now, even though everybody else in the room didn't know that Judas was a thief, Jesus did. Jesus knew his heart. 
And as Jesus uh, sat and he probably heard the objections, he probably, this is when he stood up and he said, you know, that's enough. What Mary's doing is very important. Uh, don't get on her case. Leave her alone. And the point I believe that Jesus is trying to make here was that they needed to leave her alone because even though there were poor and there was going to always be poor, and even though the, they were, the other disciples were probably basing their attitude out of Deuteronomy 15, where God told them that they were going to have poor and they needed to take care of the poor. I believe what Jesus wanted them to see was that the poor were always going to be around. Ministry is always going to be there. But Jesus wanted to make sure that they understood that he wasn't going to be, that he was only going to be there for a short while. And so Mary was doing, once again, the needful thing and ministering to Jesus and using the ointment to, to show her devotion to. But what about you? Imagine you were in this room. Who would you be? Would you be Mary? Just willing to 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 use the 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 finest of what you had to bring honor and worship to Jesus, or maybe you're Judas. Got your own agendas. You see, it, Mary here she had to overcome some obstacles to do what she did. First of all, in dinners like this, the women were never present. The women were typically serving, or they were in the kitchen, but they weren't at the table reclining with the men. But Mary decided she was going to come in and be a part of this occasion. Secondly, uh, women of this day, they didn't let their hair down like Mary did to wash Jesus' feet. People who uh, w would think of a woman who let their hair down and mixed public uh, as scandalous. Because this was this was a, an act of intimacy, and here we see Mary did both of these. She she came where she necessarily wasn't invited, and she did what what some people would just look down upon. But I believe she really didn't care what others thought about, because what she was doing, she was doing to honor Jesus, in despite of who was there. What could drive her to such devotion? What brought her to honor Jesus in this way? I believe that that she knew exactly and believed exactly uh, when Jesus said who he was, she believed it. And because she believed it, she was willing to make the sacrifices that were necessary to give him honor that was truly due him. Because what we've come to realize is this, that real worship always costs the worshiper. Real worship always involves sacrifice. Second, we see why would Mary give this kind of devotion is Mary's response was the typical response of somebody that listens to the words of Jesus and responds. We know from last week that Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And she absorbed everything that Jesus had to say. And because she did that, the natural response then would be worship. And so when it came time to come and honor Jesus in such a way, I believe that it was easy for her because she was just doing what Jesus had called them to do. And then third, I, and this is really um, why I believe uh, Mary gave um, her, her worship to Jesus was this, because it was a, Mary's response was typical of someone that had, um, I'm sorry, Mary's response was one of gratitude. Uh, Jesus had done so much for her, um, but um, of all the things that done, can anybody think about one thing specifically that they were there to honor that she would have taken to heart? Jesus gave her back her brother, didn't he? And so while Mary is considering all of these things, she's thinking about her relationship with Jesus, how, how Jesus came and ministered to her, how Jesus took care of her, how, how Jesus met her when she was at her lowest and, and, and at that time of her brother's death. Really, it pushes the question to us, what drives our devotion? How do we honor Jesus in, in our own life? 
Well, let's ask the same questions that Mary had to ask of herself. Mm -hmm. Number one, when we worship, does our worship involve sacrifice? The first thing is sacrifice of self. To, to honor somebody else, we have to humble ourselves. And so does, does our sacrifice, um, do we sacrifice ourselves? Or what about our stuff? Um, a lot of times we'll give Jesus the honor that's due to him, but do we give him, uh, are we willing to part with our things in order to honor him with our things? Do we look at our houses and our cars and our personal possessions? Do we look at those as ways that we can honor Jesus with? Second question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to worship is this. Is the way in, in which you respond to the world around you rooted in Scripture? We know that Mary listened to Jesus and, and, and she wanted to, to do everything that Jesus said. So when we come before God and we worship him, have we spent time in Scripture? Does our worship come out of Scripture? Does our worship come out of learning who God is and applying that to our life? Thirdly, we see when we ask ourselves, uh, about our, our own worship habits is this. Have you taken the time to account for the things that Christ has done for you? So here we see that worship, you know, it comes from three areas. Worship comes out of sacrifice. Worship comes out of out of um, our, our willingness to, to get into scripture and, and learn who God is. And then now we see that worship is sitting down and thinking and recounting all the things that Christ has done for us, just like Mary did. Mary honored Jesus because she, she knew exactly what Jesus had done for her. So today, as we're thinking about this, what has Jesus done for you? Can you take that and turn it into worship? But then there was another guy in the room. This guy, he was kind of an unsavory character. And so we have to ask ourselves as we're reading this scripture, are there times when we're more like Judas? Now, I know nobody listening to this today will probably say, yeah, you know, there's a time I act like Judas. Because you see, when it comes to asking ourselves this question, if we're really going to be honest with this, it's hard to admit that we may be like Jesus or Judas. but it's easy to do without even realizing we're doing it. So let's look a little bit at Judas just for a moment to see. Now, as I said, it would take a lot for us to admit that we were um, anything like Judas. And, and Judas was a thief. Judas was unfaithful. And Judas was a hypocrite. So if we think about Judas, we might automatically say, no, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not anything like that. But the truth is, when we're not faithful in our devotion to Christ, then we're exactly all of these things. So let's take a minute. What, what makes a thief a thief? Well, number one, a thief, when we're thinking about it, they want what they want. And they feed their own appetites at the expense of others. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So are there times when we enter into a, a atmosphere of worship or we, when we get to come back together as family? Um, are, are there times when we come and we have a clear agenda about the things that we want out of this? Or are we willing to sacrifice ourselves and yield over to the spirits leading to serve somebody else? Because a thief, like I said, they take what they want and they feed their own appetites, even at the expense of others. But another thing we know about thieves is that they're sneaky, they're manipulative. They 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 want to come under the cover of darkness. Um, Job twenty four sixteen says, "In the dark they break into houses, which they marked for themselves in the daytime." They do not know the light. And so there's times when we're not focused on the light, Jesus and his agenda. And we're not worried about being that light that's on a hill or, or that city that's on a hilltop. And what we're more focusing on is, is ourselves and the things that we want. And so we then begin to plot. How can I get those? How can I achieve my agenda? Um, and, and so we become sneaky and, and we become um, contriving different ways to do what we want. And the third thing that really marks a thief is giving is not in their nature. 
Um, now, I know someone out there is probably thinking, well, what about Robin Hood? Well, that's a different case, and there was only one of him, and I guarantee you that most thieves are not Robin Hood because um, giving just simply isn't in their nature. And I think this is the area that a lot of times we have to examine ourselves. Um, Malachi 3.8 is a famous verse, and I know a lot of times when the preacher is going to preach about tithing, this is where he goes to. But in Malachi 3.8, Malachi the prophet records these words. He says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, And what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now, Malachi was writing to the Israelites, and, and the Israelites had become really self-centered in this era. And they were giving back to God the way God required of them. And the push that I want, to, I want us to see is that a lot of times we can be a Judas and not desiring to give. Now, I know someone may be thinking, you know, we're in a New Testament church, and, and tithing isn't a principle in a New Testament church. But, okay, let's go there for a second. Let's just say tithing isn't a principle. At what point as a believer are we called not to give back gratitude to God? Because to me, when we're talking about tithing and we're talking about offerings, essentially what we're saying is, God, you have blessed me with all of these things. And, and here's my opportunity to give back just a little bit of what you have given me. And so, so when we decide that, you know what, this is my stuff, I don't have to give God any of it, then what we're, we are robbing God. We're, we're thieving from him. Because the way we give to God um, reflects our attitude about how he uh, exists in our life. Because as we see here, attitude empowers action. But we also see that Judas, Judas was unfaithful. So what makes a person unfaithful? Simple. When you know all the right answers about Jesus, but there is absolutely zero transformation. Basically, you know, you could pass any Bible quiz there is because you know it all about what it says. But when you look at your life, what evidence is there that Christ is real? What evidence is there that there has been transformation? Now, if you could spend one year walking with Jesus, do you think it would change the way you live? What if you could spend three and a half years walking with Jesus? Do you think that would radically transform the way you live, the way you thought? Do you think it would just shake your world? For the most of us, I believe it would. But it's not always a guarantee. Because there's this guy named Judas. Judas spent three and a half years with Jesus, and it didn't change him one bit. You see, he had all of the knowledge that Jesus taught. He seen all of the things that Jesus did. He, he, he embraced, I mean, he didn't really embrace, but he, he encountered Jesus' true nature, his character. And yet, it didn't change him one iota. So yeah, we could come into contact with the Word on a daily basis. And if we don't allow that Word to transform us, then we're, we're a sham. We're unfaithful because God is giving us, uh, given us a love letter in His Word. One of the scariest and saddest verses I believe that's recorded in Scripture is Matthew chapter seven, verses twenty-one through twenty-three, when Jesus says, "Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven." Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I say this is one of the scariest and saddest verses in the world, word because it's exactly what I'm talking about. There are people who will hear God's word. There will be people who are challenged to do the things that God says we need to do. And they'll never do them because they don't want to. Because they don't want to experience transformation. They don't practice or they do practice lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? Well, it's refusal to, to conform to the law. Well, what is the law then? Love God love others. 
the only way that we can love God and we can love others is through enduring or through in going into transformation. The third thing we see that Judas here was a hypocrite. And the simplest definition that we see for a hypocrite is saying one thing and doing another. There's no doubt that Judas was a deceiver. He spoke up like he cared for the poor, but in truth, he only cared for himself. He was the poster child for hypocrites. But before we criticize them too much, we have to examine our own lives. So what are some things that makes us a hypocrite? If you look at just the New Testament, just the Gospels in the New Testament, what we see is that Jesus spoke out against hypocrisy more than a lot of things, mostly because he was addressing the Pharisees. But in these, he spoke out over 12 times about instances where people were possibly being hypocritical. And in these instances, these are some of the things that he notes that could possibly be a part of, of our life. So I'll share just a few of them with you. One, when we're being judgmental without examining our own behavior, that's being hypocritical. When we perform religious tasks like giving, praying, or fasting for the sake of outward appearances. When people, uh, uh, we're being hypocritical when uh, we're manipulating God's word to fit our own lifestyles. We're being hypocritical when we challenge God to, to prove himself to us. That's showing our unbelief. We're being hypocritical when we live a lifestyle that contradicts our testimony. Jesus faces, he's like, why do you call me Lord when you don't do the things I say? He called the Pharisees on multiple occasions, whitewashed tombs. We're being hypocritical when we teach something that runs contradictory to scripture. And a lot of times it's not on purpose. A lot of times it's cultural faith. It's things that we've been told, but they're not rooted in scripture. But yet we'll raise that banner. We'll fight on that hill. We're being hypocritical when we promote legalism over service. And what does service look like? It's when we show justice or doing the right thing. It's when we show mercy by being kind. And it's when we show faith by loving God. We're being hypocritical when we do not repent of sin, but pretend, pretend everything is okay in our relationship with God. And then we're being hypocritical when we hold tradition over the word of God. And so these are just a few things uh, in our lives that really make us like Judas, that we have to examine ourselves daily. Say, God, am I guilty of these? Am I doing these things? Because when it comes to the story uh, of Mary anointing the feet or Judas standing up making a scene, I want to be Mary. I want my gifts to be seen as honoring and adoring of the Father and not self-centered or just focused on myself. So as we get into this story, the story reminds us that our attitudes empower our action. So at this very moment in our lives, we are given the opportunity to recognize Jesus. So if we do, what does that look like? Look at the attitudes of those in the room who were there to honor Jesus, because these people typify what we should be doing today. First of all, look at Lazarus. Like him, we need to honor Christ for the new life we have received. Remember, an attitude of repentance empowers an action of confession. So this should lead us, if we're going to be like Lazarus and think, be, be gra grateful for our new life, we need to learn how to, to pray scripture that reminds us of our new life. And so that's what we should spend time doing is praying scripture that reminds us of the new life that was given. Romans 6 verses 6 through 7 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. 
And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul reminds us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so do we take time daily just to, to recognize that we are a new creation, that the sins that we were once bogged down in, the ones that, that defined us as being dead, because of Jesus Christ, they're no more. Jesus died on a cross so that our sins would be forgiven us. When we place our faith in him, his blood covers those sins. We are, we, we, our relationship is made right with God because of what Jesus has done. And we should celebrate the new life that he has given us every day. But not only should we look to Lazarus, but we should mimic Mary. The second essential thing we must do is praise God for his goodness. Remember, an attitude of praise empowers an action of worship. Take time this week to consider the many things God has done for you and turn them into opportunities of thanksgiving and praise. So Lazarus gives us an, a picture of, of what it looks like to honor Jesus. Mary gives us a picture of what it looks like to honor Jesus. And then we need to serve like Mary's sister, Martha. She shows us that an attitude of humility empowers an action of service. Service is rooted in devotion. If Mary wanted to, to give the very best, then we could definitely say that Martha was there to do her very best. This week, I challenge you to identify areas in your life where you are being called to serve. Are you giving everything that you have or does it take all that you have to give? Remember, attitude empowers action. So what is your attitude leading you to do? This week, I challenge you to spend time meditating and memorizing Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, right? That's attitude. That's attitude. What kind of attitude do you have, right? Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. In just a couple of Sundays, we're going to celebrate Easter. I don't know what that'll look like now. I don't know if we'll get the chance to gather as a congregation or if we'll be meeting in homes like we are now. But it doesn't matter because we're going to gather and we're going to celebrate the fact that Jesus did just what Paul tells us, that he humbled himself and that he was obedient to the cross. He gave us the example here that attitude empowers action. He desires for us to do the same thing. Our attitude should be that of Christ and our action should be humility and obedience. Spend time this week in this verse. Read it. Memorize it, dwell upon it. What does it challenge you to do? Who does it challenge you to be? Does it challenge you to be Mary, where you'll come and you'll give your very best for Jesus? Or are you going to be more like Judas? Sit back, judge, criticize, be filled full of unbelief. My challenge for you is that you're more like Christ. And that you will put on this humility and obedience. Till next week, I pray that God would bless you and your household, that you return to him, seek him, trust him, follow everything he asks you to do. I'm going to pray and then uh, dismiss and let you get back to your lives. God, I praise you and thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the word that you have given us. And Father, I gave thank you for technology. That even though we're not together, we can be together in your spirit. Father, I pray for We Like Baptist Church as well as all congregations. Father, who are meeting in homes and spread out everywhere. 
Father, I just pray that they begin praying for one another. Father, that their focus would be turned to you and, and your desire for us in this time. Father, we praise you. We thank you. Lord, if there's one there who's been listening, and Father, they know they haven't um, given their life to you, I pray today would be the day that they surrender fully to, your, to you and, and your desire for their life. God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you that you love me so much that you sent Jesus to die for me, that I might serve you because of him. Father, this week I pray that you would just take my attitude and, and focus it towards you, or that you would take my will and bend it towards yours, so that truly I can do what you call me to do. Father, thank you again for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Well. I hope you all have a great week. Um, until next time, we'll see you later.